Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Brew. This is Bill Brewster, your host. We are super fortunate to be joined with uh, Sean Stannard Stockton, the CIO of Ensemble Capital. I'm looking very, very much forward to discussing his investment process. I think you're going to have your minds blown. Many of you already know him from uh, Twitter. As a reminder, none of this is financial advice. We are not your financial advisors. We're not your fiduciaries. Do your own due diligence. Everything expressed here is opinion-based and is the opinions of Sean and I. Nothing is a invitation or a solicitation to uh, buy or sell any securities. So um, please please keep that in mind as you listen. Sean, how you doing? Doing very well, Bill. It's been a pleasure to get to know you over the years and uh very happy about your new podcast here. Listen to the first couple, they were fantastic and and glad to be here as a guest. It's uh it's been a fun endeavor. I I sort of am making a podcast that I think I would want to listen to and it's been sort of fun to know that other people that I really respect like it too. So hopefully we can give them a good episode here. I'm sure we will. Well, you you know Bill, really that approach is how you should approach everything in business. Like what is a product or a service or something that you would love and be passionate about? And that's what you go build and bring to the world, you know? And, and I would say everything about our investment strategy, while it's evolved over time, was us trying to figure out how do we want to run money? What works for us? And if there's people out there that that works for, that's fantastic, right? And and to me, that's how you build great businesses and, and great offerings and services is, is you build things around passion. And that's why so many companies are like founder-led companies that are successful because the founder was like, I believe in this, it needs to happen. And you built it, right? Look at Steve Jobs talking about, you know, uh, focus groups and don't use focus groups. People don't know what they want. You got to build what is wonderful and then hope people want it, right? And, and if you have that that product market fit, people talk like that's like something that you have to go figure out what's needed and do it. No, you build something wonderful in the world and you hope to you really hope it fits into the market. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a somewhat tough question here. Did you stumble into a wonderful product and ensemble or did you really take over and build it? I I don't know much about the person that you joined to join the firm, but you were employee too, right? I was. Yeah. Like, just like, um, like many people who build something, there was some very big stroke of luck and, and then hard work mixed in to, to lead to where, where you got to. So, you know, I was like the prototypical, you know, 13 year old kid who read a book about stock picking. Um, my father was a sociologist professor. My mom was a psychologist. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't interested in wall street in the least. And, uh, I came across this book. I won't even mention his name. It was a terrible book. It was, <laughs> it was <laughs> awful advice, but I didn't care. I was a 13 year old, right? It was like a get rich quick scheme, sort of stock picking book. Um, but it set me on this journey and, you know, I went to college and got an econ degree and I graduated in the late nineties and, and went right into, you know, the investment world. And, and then through a kind of a series of, of moves was introduced to um, the founder of Ensemble Capital, a man named Kurt Brown. And he was managing about $60 million and some friends and family money. And he had a long career um, in, in Wall Street related jobs. And uh, he was in his 60s when he founded what was then Curtis Brown and Company in 1997. And I joined him in 2002. And I think we had like 15, 16 clients, something like that. And and uh, we built it from from there. And, and Kurt was somebody who um, very much recognized that he wanted to build a team, a group, a firm, right? It wasn't just him. And so about 18 months after I joined him, he said, Hey kid, let's, uh, let's, let's go into this together. Let's make this a, you know, a partnership. And we renamed the company Ensemble Capital and I took a small ownership stake. And, and uh, at that point, you know, I was a glorified operations person, right. You know, but, um, but we built it from there. What, uh, I mean, I think I know, but why Ensemble? You know, um, like naming anything, you go through lots of different different things, and and we had lots of ideas that you know thought, hey, this will be great, and we mentioned some. I said, oh my, here's this problem with it, whatever you know, and and uh, an ensemble was kind of it came out of the blue. It was a, a car ride my wife and I were having, and I knew somebody was working at a at another asset management company that had a kind of a musical name to it, and and we thought of ensemble, but ensemble means a group a group of people or things deliberately put together to work in harmony, and to me, that's what a portfolio is all about. And that's what a business is all about. And so, you know, it kind of it kind of fit. It just seemed like an obvious one once we named it. Something that I think has been really cool to watch about your firm over the last three years is you are almost set up for COVID without even knowing it because you guys are all distributed geographically, right? Yeah, I mean, that too was, um, you know, just something kind of happenstance in a way. So we were not, I mean, that was, it was maybe, I guess, about three years ago or so, four years ago. Um, we were all 100% in the office and everything, and and um, 
we just, you know, the traffic in the Bay Area is terrible, right? And, and mm-hmm. every year, I got, the commutes got longer and longer. And, and I think we interviewed somebody who lived in San Francisco and our offices are in Burlingame, which, you know, once upon a time was like a 20 minute drive down the 101, down the peninsula. And it's, you know, these days it could be an hour or pre-COVID, it could be, you know, an hour during traffic. And, and the person was like, well, it just seems like a too long of a commute. And we're like, gosh, if we can't hire people in San Francisco, how are we? I mean, like, that's just for the city up the street, right? And, yeah. and um, so we started doing remote and, and we started off one day a week. I'm just saying you can, anyone wants to can work one day a week and then it was two days a week and then we were kind of like this is working great and so you know I think it was maybe two and a half years ago we told people look just, just work where you need to work to get whatever work you're doing done hmm. that, that's what that's where you need to work there's no this isn't about you know what do you write it's not a, it's not a, um, a perk for the staff right it's about work where you need to work to get the most work done you know and and um, and that quickly kind of evolved to about 40 percent office occupancy um and uh and you know client facing people are in the office more um the research team todd and rf the analysts don't have a lot of need to be in the office or anything like that and and um and so then we started hiring some full-time remote people and and so we went into covid um with you know i think maybe two people full-time remote and other people um you know had desks but they weren't in there all that much or anything but on march i think it was 16th we flipped the switch and just turned off the office right and and um and I had some worries about like, can we onboard new clients and, and all this sort of stuff? But we've actually had uh, our best year um, in our history in terms of new new client growth, new asset growth. And and um, so everything's working well, but it sure helps that, you know, the whole client world got a crash course in Zoom as well, right? And so <laughs> once by a time, we we might have been able to do it, but our clients wouldn't have been able to do it, yeah. right? And, and and now everyone's able to do it. And, and so it was very quick and um, we've actually... Um, onboarded two full-time remote employees since COVID started. Um, I've never met them in person and um, it's moving great, works really well. And, and you just realize how many of the trappings of life that you took for granted aren't always needed. And yet there's some that's super critical. I mean, I, post COVID, humans are social animals. People are gonna get back together again, no doubt about it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, what has have you encountered just running a business onboarding? I mean, I know you said that the the onboarding process has gone well, but have there been any challenges that you as an operator have had to overcome? How do you figure out like bringing an employee on? How do you get them up to speed and meeting the team? Is it is Zoom a sufficient way to introduce people to the team or does it create its own sort of, uh, I guess, hardships or I don't know if that's even the right word, but you know what I'm asking, right? I mean, I think like anything, it, it has some things that are better and easier and some things that are harder and, and more challenging, right? And and uh, I think that the, the most important thing about remote work is that um, if you have a remote work employee, but the firm is not a remote first firm, it, it's got big problems. Uh, they're always going to be kind of like second class citizens. I interviewed an analyst before we were a remote work firm and um, the analyst, she was the only remote analyst on her team. And she was saying, you know, it's like little things like there's there's birthday cake in, in the break room on everyone's birthday, except for the remote person. Right. Mm-hmm. And their birthday just gets skipped. And it's not, it's not a big deal. But those things cumulatively create a culture in which the remote employees are secondary or separate from the kind of the real team in the office. You know, and so when I hear these these CEOs of big companies saying, well, the whole executive team is going back to the office, but remote you know, everyone else, you can work remote if you want to all those top performing employees are going to what they hear is that the top performers are in the office. Right. Yeah. And if you want a career path, you will go into the office, too. And so to me, it's really about um, if remote work actually works for your firm, which it will not for everybody, then it should be a firm wide commitment. And, and there's no reason why a senior person would need to be in the office any more than a junior person, unless, of course, the day to day tasks require in-person activity for the senior executive, you know. Um, and so, you know, yeah, yes, of course, there's challenges, but there's other things that are that are faster and better, you know, and and gosh, you got to have a staff that that can write well and write fast and. And, and feels fluent in that way, you know, and and so I'm sure that there's certain employees who would not thrive in this sort of environment, but our team it seems to be doing doing great. And we also do intentionally a lot of social stuff. I mean, it's been hard to figure that stuff out, you know, but but that's important, right? So we have a whole dedicated social chatter kind of, you know, we don't use Slack, we use something else, but something similar to that, you know, that's one of the most vibrant communication channels, you know, and huh. and we really go out of our way to celebrate, you know, each other and what they're doing, hearing about each other's kids and None of that stuff changes just because you're remote, you know? Yeah. I've I've wondered coming out of this, I've heard some people say that 
you know, the smaller businesses that I talk to occasionally, maybe 15 employees or less, right? Talk about like going completely remote. And the question that I've had is, are you, how are you going to handle the junior people that you onboard? Because I think that to me is like the real risk. Uh, there's a lot, I say it in family times a lot, uh, quantity of time turns into quality of time. And I feel like the workplace is very similar. It's going to be interesting to see how everything sort of evolves coming out of this. Yep. If the managers are all in office and the new junior people are remote, you got a huge problem, right? Um, but there's nothing that a junior person is missing if their manager is remote, right? Yeah. <laughs> if the junior person's remote, you know? And, um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, for this audience, of course, what's most relevant is the investment team, the research team here and how they're ac- operating remote. And so, you know, to me, um, it, when we hired uh, Todd Wenning, who's one of our analysts who has, who was, who was our first full-time remote employee, he lives outside Cincinnati, um, at the time, RF, who now lives down in the San Diego area, but at the time lived in Silicon Valley, where I live and where the firm's headquarters are, um, one of the reasons we hired Todd was to bring somebody on who wasn't in the Silicon Valley bubble. And uh, you know, just a quick quick story about that. You know, at the, we owned Starbucks at the time; we still do. And and uh, you know, everybody I knew was talking about mobile ordering and rewards and digital, and Starbucks is killing it. And Todd's like, you know, um, drive-throughs are super important to the business model. I was like, what are you talking about? There's no drive throughs around here, you know? <laughs> and and he's talking, and he's right, you know? Yeah. He's talking about, you know, you install a drive through in a Starbucks that needs a drive through of course, and you, you know, significantly increase profitability and everything. And what Starbucks talking about, you know, this whole year, we're putting in drive-ins all through the Midwest and the Southeast, and this is a huge lift. And they just talked about their investor day a day or two ago. And, you know, this is exactly right, right? But in Silicon Valley, there are no drive throughs for, for, for Starbucks, right? And and so that kind of cognitive diversity from having distributed workforce in the research team is is uh, an advantage for us and and one that I would never want to run money with a team of people all physically in the same geographic office all the time. I think you are at a deep disadvantage of your research team is all working out of one city from one office. They have too many of the same experiences, too many of the same you know networks they're part of, and there's they're going to become part of group think. So uh, for me... That's one of the key advantages, um, and and COVID only kind of didn't change any of that. We were already doing that as a research team. Yeah, I thought that was super cool when you hired uh, Todd. I I'm you know got to know him through Twitter, as probably many listeners have, and you know then when when I found out he was from Ohio, I liked him even more because I have a Midwest bias. And then when you guys hired him, and you said something about the fact that you wanted some geographical diversity, I mean you know I. I thought that that was a very cool move by you to pick a Midwestern person as opposed to the East Coast because, you know, the Midwest is honestly forgotten about a lot. Uh, and the way that I think Midwestern people look at the world, um, I, I, you know, it's they're not like an oppressed group or anything, but I do think that they're it's flyover country for a reason. Yeah, everybody has different experiences, and I, I think that's a critical part of any um, research process is, is for people to understand that your the, the life experiences that you have inform the way you look at the world, right? Yeah. And, and you cannot take those blinders off. You can do your, your best to kind of try and appreciate, have empathy for other points of view and incorporate that. I mean, we own companies that sell stuff that I'm not a customer of, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not looking to buy companies that make the stuff for me. Like we started the interview talking about build processes, your, your products you're passionate about, right? Yeah. As an investor, it's not just finding things that, that I'm passionate about or Todd's passionate about. It's about finding companies that sell something that have met, have a, a match in a passionate way with their customer base, whoever they might be, you know? And, and so having people with different life experiences and backgrounds um, is, is key. So when you're doing, and when you're doing research on a company like that, that maybe you don't have uh you know, personal connection with or whatever isn't completely in your direct circle of competence, so to speak. How do you get comfortable with, are you doing surveys of their customers? Are you talking to their customers? Like, how are you getting into their customer's mind? Gosh, it can be so different. Um, yeah, for every kind sort of, a generic of company, question, you know, isn't it? and Sorry. no, but, but no, 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 it's, but it's, it's, it's not a generic question. It's, a, it's, there's every, it's just a different answer for every single company, you know? Yeah. And, and, um, you know, I, I know that, for instance, I personally um, have had a lot of interest and in success in investing in, in B2B companies and, and B2B kind of like software service providers. And they're often kind of under un, undercovered um, by investors, and, unless, of course, they're kind of like brand new SaaS B2B businesses in which they're overcovered, right? But I mean, if, if you're talking about, um, you know, a lot of businesses that are, that are 
they're just not a little bit kind of invisible in the grand scheme of things, you know. And yet, many of them um, have this attribute that creates a fantastic competitive advantage, which is offering some sort of product or service to the other business that's the customer that is mission critical to the functioning of that company, but which is a super low portion of the overall cost structure, right? Yeah. So if you look at a business like Paychex that we've owned for a number of years, and so if if you as a company, the customer, right, the business that is the payroll customer of Paychex, if they don't process payroll correctly, <laughs> they have an instantaneous crisis on their hands, right? I mean, yeah. you know, employees are not like, oh, no big deal. It's just a little bit of an error. You know, it's like it has to be right 100% of the time, right? Yeah. And the IRS gets really rather pissed off if, <laughs> if you don't, you know, withhold correctly and everything, right? And so this is like mission critical, but it's also something that the company wants to forget about. You just don't want to think about payroll. It just wants to get done, right? Yeah. And, and no one would ever say like, well, my payroll gets done extra special well. No, there's just a threshold. It needs to get done 100% correct all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's but, either but right or it's that, wrong. We're exactly, pretty binary but, here. <laughs> yeah, right. But there's not like high-end payroll. Right. Yeah. It's like it's it is what it is. Right. And and so if you look at business like paychecks, um, if somebody comes along and says to the, the customer, right, the, the customer that's um, buying the service from paychecks and says, listen, hey, we can do it for free and just as good. Right. And then you, you talk to the, the kind of head of HR, the head of HR says, it's going to be great, be free, you know, and you say, well, guess what? It won't even show up as a rounding error on our financial statements, the, the money that we're going to save. Yeah. And so, yeah, but we might as well save the money. But is, could there be any issues, right? Well, I mean, like maybe we have a couple weeks of problematic payroll or somebody's bonuses doesn't get processed correctly. And, oh, yeah, it'll be a ton of work for HR. And why are we doing this then, right? Just stick with what works, you know? Yeah. And, and and so that can also lead to these B2B service providers becoming kind of um, almost exploitive um businesses, right? Where they're like, hey, no one pays attention to us. Let's just keep jacking up prices and we won't invest in our product. And over time, they mortgage their moat, this phrase that we talk about, right? Where they, you, you, you take steps that make it look like you're getting more and more profitable. Things are great, but really you're creating negative goodwill with your customers, right? By, by not investing in the product and overcharging it for the service, but nobody really cares because it's such a small price until one day people wake up and say, this is ridiculous, right? Yep. And you lose tons of customers. So you'd be very careful of that, right? But when you have these, these companies that are mission critical at a low cost and they continue to improve the product and make it better and, and they do all that, you can, create very sticky, very sustainable, super lucrative, high return on invested capital businesses. Um, and so here I'm, I'm getting off track raving about these businesses, but you asked about the customers and how we get to know them. Right. And so I, you know, I've always thought like, these aren't that hard to understand. And, 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 but somebody a while ago was like, yeah, but Sean, you've been involved in building and running a business and it's a small one. Mm. Right. And, uh, and it occurred to me that that's true. Like some of these things are, are, they just kind of make sense to me, you know, and, and running a 15 person firm does not mean that I'm an operator and that I understand these things at a high level. Um, but I think that trying to just put your, you can put yourself in the shoes of, you know, if, if you are a manufacturer and you're working with Fastenal, a business that we own and they're supplying things to you and understanding about, you know, that they're, they're carrying kind of inventory for you off your balance sheet and getting it to there just in time. All this stuff just kind of makes intuitive sense to me personally, you know, yeah. um, whereas, whereas RF on our team has a huge interest in, in biotech and science and and you know he went to MIT and initially he was going to be an astrophysicist before he discovered ec economics you know oh, and, wow and uh, so he has a passion and interest in understanding the science behind a lot of this stuff that I'm like uh, that's that's not my interest I, yeah. I can read it process it do my best to understand it you know and uh, and so I think everyone on the team has different different um, companies that they have more interest in and and yeah of course we can talk to customers or you know read surveys reach out to stuff and. And, uh, but, but if we feel like we are that distant from understand, being able to understand it, we'd probably move on to something else. That makes sense. I got to ask you about a hot button company. Uh, you talked about B2B and a low portion of, of cost. And I know in the past you have had an affinity for Transdime and it's such a controversial name. Uh, how do you reconcile those two thoughts? I, I, I own it. So I think that I'm closer to your camp than uh, what sort of the people that would argue that it's an exploitative business would argue. Um, probably the most, uh, I guess, cogent's the word I'm looking for, argument that I've heard is what you said, that they deliver on time uh, service for the airlines. But I'm just interested to sort of hear you wax poetic about it, if you don't mind. 
So we owned Transdime for many years and we we fully exited the position in January or February this year, um, not with any foresight about the virus, the pandemic. Um, we exited for valuation reasons and sometimes it's a lot better to be lucky than than good. Now I know the stocks come back dramatically, but it, it fell and, and it would have been, you know, there, it was an existential, like everyone's been talking about their debt levels and well, this was the event. This was the event that should have killed Transdime that everyone said was going to kill Transdime, right? And and everyone said, oh, I said, hey, look, you know, the sustainability of passing miles and it's going forever and then this year happens right and so yeah. as a reminder this year is a great reminder and transdime is a great reminder that like things that have never happened before do happen yeah right and and uh, this was one of those um we we are long Heiko now and and for anyone who follows the kind of transdime and Heiko, it's like you know the dark side and the light side you know he's <laughs> the, the good guy and transdime's the evil one and and but while we own transdime um and and you know our view <clears throat> is that the customers are the airlines, not the people, the shorts, the politicians who complain and say that Transdime is ripping off other people, right? Um, the airlines, um, certainly you can find quotes, people saying, gosh, they charge a lot. But this is not an industry, a company that is like constantly badgered by the, their actual customers saying, you're really screwing us here, you know? And, and the fact is, is that it is really important that somebody keeps making these products that have been, you know, designed and effectively kind of out of production or they're still being produced. But I mean, like, you know, it's for a airline platform that's no longer in production. And like, these are older things. Right. And so one of the ways I thought about it is, you know, um, when I go down to the local Ace Hardware and I want to buy like a, a screw that fits a particular thing. And my house was built almost 100 years ago. Right. So I got to find this kind of odd screw or whatever. And I and, and they have this huge rack at Ace Hardware with all these different screws. Right. And I find it and I buy one and it's 15 cents. Right. Well, it's like a penny of metal, but I don't sit there and say they are <laughs> crushing me on on the profit margins here. This is outrageous, right? So you have like 90, 85 percent profit margins here. So who cares? Yeah. What, what am I really paying for with that fifteen cents? I'm paying Ace a cert the for the service of maintaining this inventory, having it available, getting it to me just as I need it, right? It is if you look at the product margins, you're you're paying attention to the exactly the wrong thing. That's not what, what's going on here. They're not selling you the product, right? They're selling you the solution to your problem and they're maintaining the inventory of those solutions for you, right? And so that's kind of how I think about Transdime is that they they do this work that nobody else wants to do, right? And and they maintain all this stuff and they get it there just in time. And and so to me, a much of the complaints were somewhat I'm, um, you know, kind of uh, not appreciating what was actually being bought and sold in the, yeah. in the situation, you know. Um, all that being said, we had many debates about this exact same issue. It's a controversial stock and we don't own it anymore, but yeah. not, not because of this issue, you know, but it was, it was, it was one we talked a lot about, you know, is the, the debate is a, is a healthy and good debate. I thought it was interesting when they were in front of Congress and I, I thought that Howley's answer when when somebody asked him about his margins and he said you know look if you want to go build the product go build it right like we are not a cost plus uh designer of product like your typical government contractor we are a commercial operator and this is how the business works um you know i don't know that was a lot more um What's the word? I mean, I, it was con more convincing to me than things that I, th I I kind of went into that hearing skeptical. And when I listened to it and really process how he answered it, I said, you know, this actually makes a lot of sense, which was not what I expected. So another controversial stock that you've uh, certainly been right on from a price perspective, I'm going to argue that you've been right for the right reasons is Netflix and uh, currently is a pretty large holding in your portfolio. I I have watched you over the years prove all the naysayers wrong, I think for the right reasons. And maybe uh, you can help us figure out what everybody else is missing when they're focused on current free cash flow. So let me just start off by saying I was one of the naysayers um, in the past. Um, you know, one of the things that we do with idea generation is we don't pay any attention to valuation at all as part of the uh, deciding what are we going to go look at. My view is that if you can actually value and have a sense of intrinsic value before you've decided to do the work on a company, like what are we all doing all day, right? <laughs> and so the idea that people, before they do the work, could look and say, well, it's, it's really expensive. Let's look at it later. It's not worth looking. Like how could that be? The market's pretty efficient, 
yeah. right? Like, well, it's challenging to outperform the market, which means that most of the time, most stocks are trading kind of close to fair value, right? Yep. At least that should be your default assumption, even if they appear on the surface to look like they're overvalued or undervalued, you know? And, and, um, and so we don't, we don't think about valuation when we first look at things. And, and I and, and the other analysts all try and, you know, bite our tongue when someone else on the team starts looking at something that maybe we don't think's a good idea because that's the whole point of having this, this cognitive diversity is different people have different ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, RF was the one who, who started looking at, at Netflix. He'd followed it way before he joined Ensemble. And, but all I could remember was when they sold shares um, and then they had the whole blow up with Flickster and everything. And, and then they, they, then they, they bought, excuse me, they bought back shares at like 150 or something. They had Flickster, then they had to sell shares. And to me, I was like, well, these guys are the worst capital allocators in the world. Right. But this is one of these, I mean, I wasn't even following the story. It was like, I read a headline. It's like, I don't even need to pay attention to them. They're terrible capital allocators. I don't have to think about this anymore. Horrible thing to do. Right. Huh. But it was one of those cognitive biases. Right. And so I brought that up to Arif and he was like, yeah, but it was the right thing to do to issue those shares, right? Look what they've done. They made a mistake and then they corrected that mistake probably faster than most companies ever correct mistakes. Yeah. And I was like, that's exactly right. Like, what do I want more than anything from a management team? Because they're all going to make mistakes, every single one of them. I want a management team that recognizes and corrects those mistakes as quickly as possible. And so once I realized, I was like, well, maybe I've got this exactly wrong. Maybe this this management team is is fantastic, right? It's just that I saw them make a mistake and wrote them off, right? And um, and so you know we started working on on the name, and and I think that the key insight that that RF had, and 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 you know other people talk about pricing power. I'm not suggesting this is like our own, you know, no one else is talking about this. But the key thing that that when he was looking at it, explained to me that that we as a firm is you know we all believe this is that the company is underpricing their product versus what it's worth in the market. And if you think about how kind of a traditional tangible asset brick and mortar companies kind of thing grows is you grow via CapEx. When you, you, know, you invest into CapEx and that gives you the opportunity to drive revenue and gap accounting lets you say all that CapEx, it doesn't even count. It's not an expense. Let's just take it off the income statement and only depreciation runs through it, right? And that's that's gap accounting. This is, it doesn't matter how old school you are. Everyone understands, yes, of course, big CapEx is not an expense. Right? It's a future thing over time, but it's not, and it's not an expense, right? And so, you know, we, in the past, we've talked about how Home Depot had not only cash burn, negative cash, but accelerating negative cash burn all through its kind of early growth years. And by the time it was also printed, you know, great EPS and had a P of like 30, because gap accounting just let them just remove all of that, right? And so what we realized was that what Netflix was doing to grow was underpricing their product. And, but there's no accounting system, kind of rightly so, because it's, it's like more art than anything you could quantify or account for, is that about how much are they discounting for? Nobody knows, they don't know, right? Yeah. Um, but we believe that that, that, was, that was correct, right? And, and, um, and so when we initiated on the name, um, we believed all of that. But it was a very small position because we weren't 100% sure. Could they really keep raising prices, you know? But, you know, over time, they've been, they've last, I think, four or five years, it's been like 8% kegger on, on price, right? I mean, it's like, what, what big American company has been raising prices at 8% a year for the last four years in an inflation-free environment, right? I yeah. mean, th this is crazy town, right? I mean, Apple's won, but no one's going to debate that Apple has pricing power, right? So, like, clearly, right, this, this, there's something going on here. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the, that when you back into that, the big assumption we're making is is an assumption around what it is the normalized, what is kind of the true price, market clearing price that they could move it to. And of course, if they flipped the switch and did it today, they would they would lose some customers, right? But what is the price that that is a sustainable price? And you have to pick your own number. You have to figure out what you think that is. And we've published some some estimates of you know whether it's 15 or 17 or 20 or 25, and you know what is that that number? I mean, I can tell you myself, right? Like if, if I was going to lose access to Netflix, if unless I pay like $50 a month, I'd be like, of, of, of course I'd pay $50 a month. It's the primary way my family watches television, right? I mean, the average American household watches two hours a day of Netflix, yeah. right? I mean, that's 60 hours. So if 60, 60, $60 uh, a month would be $1 an hour to watch TV, right? I mean, and, and you're still cheaper than cable television. And everybody was paying, you know, way over $60, of, you know, $50 a month for television right and so yep. so we don't assume they're going to charge 50 dollars. that's not the normalized price but but it's difficult to argue that the price where they price it now is somehow like well this is the right price and so clearly to us they're discounting it significantly and so 
we think that they're going to be able to raise it over time as they have in the U.S. You've seen their profit margins expanding dramatically in the U.S. as they reach maturity. And we think that's going to keep keep happening. And so um, to us, that discount is like their CapEx, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand that and think about how it plays out over time. But but to us, um, the stock's cheap at 500. It's not expensive. You know, what's been interesting to me through the pandemic is even when sports came back, they had a long, I, I don't know what ratings are doing now, but it seems as though it's at least possible that the pandemic has somewhat changed. I, I don't know if how much people value sports is the right way to frame what I'm saying, but it has been interesting that even when sports came back, people still seem to turn to streaming for their entertainment. And I don't know if it's because there weren't fans in the seats or it's not communal. I'm not, I think there's a number of factors that could be contributing to that, but um, that has been a very interesting thing to follow from, from my perspective. I think one aspect about the pandemic in, in the United States in particular um, is that kind of the overall shelter in place environment has persisted for a long time and is mm -hmm. going to continue to persist for a while. And what that means is that habits are being formed mm -hmm. and habits are hard to change, right? And so if you look at, imagine we had all gone back to work after two months and kind of life was back to normal. We would not have new habits. All this stuff at remote work here to stay, it would all just have gone back because people like, well, that was just this weird event and now we'll go back to my old habits, right? But now you keep streaming, right? You keep playing video games with your kids, right? You keep using Zoom to talk to your family. You keep doing remote work. You actually bring on new employees who are full-time remote and you've never met them before. And all this stuff becomes habit. Yeah. And then the habit breaking is going back to how things used to be. And breaking habits is hard, yeah. right? And so the pandemic and its impact in the United States persisting for as long as it has means that the habits to break are going to are these new habits that we're all forming right yep. now. So, so what's the relationship with with sports? I, I don't know for sure, but I have to think that that televised sports have lower relevance to American video consumers in the future than than pre pandemic. You know, and 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 I there's different ways to look at the data right now, but right now we just don't really know. There's so much so much changing. You know, I do think sports are certainly not going away. They play a critical role for a lot of people's lives and they're, you know, I think there's a lot of kind of human DNA and genes that drive interest in, in sports. And, um, but, uh, but to your point, uh, you know, uh, NFL football is not what, you know, a lot of 16 and 17 year olds are thinking about the main thing they want to watch on, on Netflix or YouTube or Amazon or anything. Yeah. And, and to your point, like, let's say that the interest is in, in televised sports is even coming out of this as a, a, compared to 2019. I don't think that you can possibly make an argument that the interest has increased, right? So on a probability distribution, I think if you're relying on sports, you've got a negative skew to your to the assumption that you're relying on. I, I don't yeah. know how negative or whatever, but like to not at least adjust your brain that way, I think is not paying attention to reality. Agreed, agreed. How do you think through... What Roku, I, I don't know if you do, but I, the, I guess that the Roku bulls would say, well, Roku is going to be the new bundler, right? And everybody else can sort of offer a substitute product to what Netflix can offer, right? So HBO Max, you got Viacom coming out with their thing, Discovery Plus, yada, yada, yada. How do you think through how Netflix sort of competes with those offerings for people's mind share? Yeah. So relating that to the kind of the, the normalized price I talked about, right? So the price that, that people pay for things is not what it's worth to them, but a blend of what it's worth to them and the market clearing price, right? Yeah. So we don't pay very much for water, <laughs> but water is super important <laughs> to us, right? Yeah. And the reason we don't pay very much to water is not because it's not worth very much to us, but because of the market conditions, we can get it for cheap. So that's what we get it for, right? And, and so just because something is valuable does not mean that it is going to be expensive basically, right? It, it depends on the market conditions. And that's why we care so much about competitive advantages, right? And so you have all of this, you know, these, you know, HBO Max coming in and Disney Plus and, and they were all supposed to kill Netflix. That was the whole, the whole deal, right? And, and just as a quick aside, 
all legacy media companies could have killed Netflix not all that long ago, right? They, they just made this huge mistake of thinking that it was incremental revenue for them. So they said, hey, well, this is great. Let's just sell the content we're selling already. Sell the second time to Netflix. How wonderful. And they fed the beast that's destroying them now, right? Yeah. It was just, it, it's just a classic mistake, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, I, I, it really surprises me that it actually played out that way. You know, um, you know, you hear about uh, different shows being pulled from Netflix and, and people say, well, it's going to kill Netflix. Well, it would have in the past, right? Yep. But now a lot of shows are big because they're on Netflix. It's yep. not that people subscribe to Netflix. They want to watch a show. The show gets big because it's on Netflix. And so now you have this feedback loop and the power is, is shifting towards Netflix, right? Where you just want your content. If you're content, producer you want to get it on netflix because that's where it's going to become a hit yeah right? that's as right. opposed to the other way around where netflix is like i need this important content so i can sell subscriptions right and so when disney plus was was preparing to come out and netflix in the beginning of 2019 you know basically took like two years of price increases it was like 15 percent, i think average arpu increase like that because they knew disney was coming and they were like we don't want to increase prices you know right after disney launches right but man, how, how amazing that you can say competitive threats coming let's just jack our prices you know dramatically yeah. now and yeah, i mean wow we're talking about preparing position. for yourself right and then when Disney Plus came along and the stock did really, you know, pretty weak in, in 2019 and, and, and as that kind of threat came along. And and Disney Plus has been an amazing success. I mean, it's like seeming like every family with kids has Disney Plus. I mean, their subscriber numbers are off the charts. Now, they did a lot of that through just basically giving it away for free, right? Yeah. Um, but still, it's still out there. They have these huge subscriber numbers. And yet it's it's like been immaterial in terms of churn for for Netflix, right? I mean, you, you can't exactly attribute what's going on, but our estimates are five percent or, or less of people that subscribe to Disney Plus cancel a Netflix subscription, right? Hmm. And and so um, what that means is that Disney was was a compliment, not not a competitive threat to, yeah. to Netflix. And so if Disney launched the bazooka to attack Netflix and failed to dent Netflix, that tells you something very important about Netflix. So we talk about like moat attacks, right? When one of the best indicators of a moat is when somebody launches a competitive threat and it is a well-resourced, well-executed competitive attack and it fails, right? So Disney, it didn't, Disney Plus didn't fail for Disney. It failed to, to crush Netflix in any meaningful way. Yep. And we think they're both going to do great over time. We are not negative on Disney Plus at all. They're making all the right moves. What they're doing is the playbook that Netflix laid out in the past yeah they're 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 making it cheap initially they're flooding it with content they're getting it out there they're just following the netflix playbook because disney recognized gosh darn it netflix isn't playing the right playbook and now we have to play catch up right yeah. what's hbo max doing now right i mean i just got new iphones and they're like oh by the way you get hbo f max for free for a year oh okay great you know but yeah. it's like, that's the that's the right move right because now i've been poking around i wouldn't have before but now i'm poking around right yeah so everybody else is is desperate for scale and what's netflix doing they've already conquered the u.s they're going crazy internationally right yeah. and just you know growing growing the content there and so you know john malone the cable cowboy years ago now was like it's it's already too late global scale media netflix is already won you know, and, and, and he was one of the potential competitors, you know, and I know he says different things at different times and stuff like that. But, but, you know, we, it's not that we don't worry about competitive threats is that the big bazooka was fired in the form of Disney plus and, and it failed to hurt Netflix. Now I know people will say, well, just wait, they're going to have more content later. Maybe so. Right. We, we, we yeah. aren't sitting there thinking, no, there's no, there's no company that's invincible. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we think they are very well positioned to maintain maintain their hold and, and there will be competition. But it's this is not like a winner take all where there's only one streaming service and that's only everybody uses. Right. Of course, we're going to have multiple services. And so our view is just that Netflix will be the first service that every home has and that you may have other services in addition to that. But you always have Netflix. Yeah. Netflix is the new core. Exactly. Yeah. I have massive love for John Malone. He has taught me a lot. Uh, indirectly through YouTube and whatnot. And uh, I'm really happy that I found him. But I do think that they have a bit of a weak spot when it comes to uh, looking out. For instance, I, I was listening to them talk about Spotify with Sirius XM. And I, I understand why they have a bias towards current free cash flow. I mean, they, they sort of run Liberty like a private equity shop might, except they have a perpetual ownership. But I do think that Sometimes that causes a bit of either a discounting of strategy that's different or saying this doesn't make sense when it actually sort of does. The incentives are just quite a bit different from the uh, other player on the field. So 
I don't know. That'll be interesting. One of the, one of the things that I've really enjoyed you speaking about is First Republic as a customer service uh, entity as opposed to a bank. I think following your thought process, what's very cool about how you see the world or positions that you take, at least my perception of it, is you tend to see uh, something, you frame the business in a different light than what people perceive the business to be. Is that a fair characteristic, do you think? I mean, not in every case, but we definitely, if you think about like businesses that you like to find or the kind of patterns that you're looking for and and um, and Todd coined the phrase idiosyncratic businesses and, and in terms of that, that being what we're looking for, right? And, and um, uh, I mean, not that he coined to do syndicratic business for anybody, but in terms of that's a vocabulary that we use, right? In, in talking about the businesses that we talk about, which we had not previously used. And and so, you know, many of the businesses that we invest in, um, you can pull up a less list of their competitors, um, you know, like on Bloomberg and just say, oh, this is their peer group, right? But that they are doing something fundamentally different than everybody else, right? Yeah. And and it is and that that's what we're looking for because what we're looking for are businesses that have competitive advantages. And if you're doing something nobody else is doing, Right. And there's some reason why other people can't do it, then that's that's the recipe for for a great business. Right. And so in First Republic's case, you know, as a regional bank, I'm kind of the view that like, you know, banks aren't really competitive advantage. They buy and sell money. It's the ultimate commodity. Right. And and yeah, of course the giant banks have different advantages by virtue of their size. I mean, just the whole concept of too big to fail tells you something, right? Um, but um, but those those gun to use have such, you know, opaque balance sheets that it's zero interest in in investing in them for the most part. And um, but with First Republic, um, you know, this was, you know, somebody else had pointed out and, and said, this isn't a bank, it's a customer service retail franchise. And I was like, what does that mean? But it was intriguing enough that I had to go poke around and figure it out. And so the easiest way to understand it is you say, well, great customer service, right? And, and in a lot of businesses like retail or restaurants, things like that, like that's table stakes. It's not yeah. a competitive advantage to offer great customer service. Everybody offers great customer service. But the banking industry is not known for having customers that, that love them. Right? Yeah, and this and is true. Uh, Gall- we saw a poll from Gallup a couple years ago in which they showed that only 40, I think it was 30 or 40 percent of bank employees banked at the bank that they worked at. Right. Yeah, I don't and, think I banked at Pimo <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> and so and so, it, you know, even the employees are not saying this is the best the best bank for me. And so first of all, the whole thing is they are catering to high net worth individuals who value their time over an extra couple basis points of of yield. Right. Yeah. And so when I, after doing the work, you know, I know a lot of people say they find products that they like and they go invest in the business. I, I tend to be the opposite. I tend to find a business that does something great. And then I'm, suddenly I start buying their products. Like I got into lawn care after I, you know, did uh, yeah, Scott's. Scott's Miracle Grow. And, <laughs> and after that, I was like, gosh, my lawn's a disaster. And I started doing all this stuff. And so the First Republic, I, I learned after he bought the stock, I was like, why am I with this bank if this if first of all has great customer service? And and so, you know, one of the reasons, one of the, one of the pain points of switching banks is setting up your online bill pay again, right? And and so I did that at First Republic, and but one of them just wasn't kind of working right, and it, I didn't, it couldn't get it to work. And and so at my old bank, I would have had to call an 800 number, stay on hold for like 20 minutes, talk to someone who might not know what they're talking about, probably get transferred to somebody else, told I was in the wrong department, and then basically, you know, said, oh, you do these things and then hope that it works, right? With First Republic, I just emailed Rachel. I didn't email an 800 number, I didn't call him, I called, it was Rachel. Rachel's my private banker. She's been my private banker ever since I first started with First Republic. So I emailed Rachel and said, hey, Rachel, I have a problem with, with this online bill pay setup. What should I do? Who do I call? And she emailed back like 20 minutes later and said, check now. It should be fixed. Hmm. So I checked and it was fixed. That's hmm. why I bank with First Republic. Yeah. That's why people love First Republic, right? So their net promoter scores, right? Kind of the gold standard or I mean, the, the best way to manage your you know, customer satisfaction. Banks are super low. They're, yeah. they're there with like telecom, like Comcast. Some of their approval ratings are like on the par with Congress, right? For First Republic's <laughs> net promoter scores, it's like Ritz Carlton, Apple, Amazon. I mean, it's just, this is, there's something they're doing very different, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, they've grown organically. They were the first bank to ever grow without acquisition to over 100 billion. Um, and they, um, they were founded in 1984, 85 in San Francisco. And they're still a pretty small bank in the grand scheme of things, right? But they're the number two bank in San Francisco. So, you know, living here, working here, we got a lot of clients here because we work with a lot of private clients and everybody loves First Republic. Everybody. That's just weird for a bank. So that was the idiosyncratic nature of what, what we were we were capturing, right? And and so so, you know, they've been able to grow, 
their deposits at about 15% of their loan book, 15, 20% per year for many, many years. And, and anyone who's a bank investor knows you don't want to be in a high growth bank because they're taking too much credit risk because how else could they be growing quickly, right? Yeah. You give away loans to people who don't can't afford to pay them back. That's how you grow fast, right? And First Republic actually has the best credit metrics, right? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's way better than all the big banks, right? And so how do you grow fast with great credit quality? You're doing something different and that's the customer service. Yeah, that's very cool. Did you have early in your career... Like, were you always sort of drawn to this quality? Uh, you also talk about stakeholder, like, you know, stakeholder capitalism. I've heard you talk about. Uh, have you always been into that or did you make mistakes in some sort of value traps that like what what brought you around to this way of looking at the world? So I got into um, like started working professionally in investment business in 1999. And so the only reason that I didn't get caught up in kind of dot-com boom sorts of stuff is all I'd ever done was read about investing, right? And all I'd read was people like Warren Buffett. And yeah. so I naively was like, well, clearly this is a stock market bubble and I have to participate. Not because I had any insight at all, just because I was like, well, the PE is over 15, therefore it's overvalued, done, right? Yeah. And it was just a, a classic know-nothing you know, statistical deep value investor. And when I say do, know nothing, I mean, as an, as a 22 year old, right. Who's just says, well, low P is all you need to know sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And, but I came, I came kind of initially from kind of the value investment kind of view of the world. Um, but Kurt, who I joined was just more growth oriented. He was always, you know, huh. sensitive on, on price and everything like that. And I, and I think that from when I started working with him up until maybe around 2010, 2011, um, while we were seeking out businesses that had competitive advantages and all of that, you might have described our strategy as more like a GARP strategy. And and then I feel like the financial crisis, if you managed money through that time, there had to have been some big lesson you learned, right? If you survived it, you have to be able to look back and think about what, what do we learn? What should we do differently? And so, you know, in, in 2008, nine and coming out in 2010, I just kind of took a deep deep breath and, and, you know, said, I went back and revisited lots of stuff I'd read early on in my career and said, okay, I, I got some experience under my belt and, you know, what do I know? And I've been doing this and I survived this disaster, you know, and, and really what stuck out to me was, was that these businesses that have competitive advantages, they are able to control their own destiny in a way that other companies are not able to. Mm. And, and having gone through the financial crisis and seen something totally out of companies control come along like a tsunami you recognize you need to be the ones that have some control over their destiny, right? And, and it may be a limited, it is, we are all subject to uncertainty. The world, is, I think, is way more uncertain than most investors appreciate. You know? yeah. And yet, to, to outperform the S&P 500, to generate some good long-term returns, you just need to have companies that are more able to control their destiny. They don't have to have complete control over their destiny. you know. And so just that really started leaning into that. And so today, when we talk about our strategy, you know, Competitive advantage is the unifying narrative behind every single one of our holdings. That's what we invest in. We look for businesses that are deeply competitively advantaged. We own a title insurance company that tra trades at eight times earnings, and we own Netflix, right? So, so we're not growth. We're not value. I don't care about low P, high P. I care about competitively advantaged business and be able to buy their stock for a price that is less than the present value of the cash flow that company is going to produce over the long, the long term. And so, to me, we're value investors, right? Because we only buy something for less than we think it's worth. And, and when we think about intrinsic value, we just mean cash flows. That's all all you get as a shareholder, right? Yeah. Is, is the is the distributable cash flow of that that business, right? And so we're value investors in that every company in our portfolio trades at a price below what we think those future cash flows are going to be. Now, something like Netflix, and maybe we're wrong, of course, right? But we don't own it because we think, hey, they're gonna have a great couple of cores and we can sell it to somebody else at six hundred, right? It's it's that we just think they're gonna produce tons of cash flow well in, in excess of their market cap. Yeah. And I, I think that um, the the margin of safety, I mean, you know, I, I guess the, the cash flow focus that I that's sort of like the Bible, right? For me is is Buffett's. This is what you get and when you know, you get the present value of all your your cash flows. And that is what enables the second way out on a lot of these things where if the stock goes against you, it just doesn't matter. And that's the one thing that like the code of the value investor that I, I hope that, you know, everybody actually sort of understands because that is the foundational basis. Now, you know, it gets hard when you're parsing, okay, well, what's growth spend and what's maintenance spend. I have a lot of problems with some of these SaaS companies because the cohort build and the land and expand. And that it, it, it seems to me like perpetually expanding SGNA, but 
um, I at least recognize that there are a lot of people that don't have those constraints around them and that they're doing rational things. I, I used to say, I'm not going to go anywhere near any of that stuff. Just give me cheap things. And then I found that I was touching stoves. And since I have oriented, you know, my way of thinking towards closer to the way that you look at the world, I still mess around and touch Wells Fargo occasionally and stuff like that. But um, I owe a lot to manual of ideas. I owe a lot to Fintwit for for pivoting the way that I look at the world. And, you know, we'll see. I guess a skeptic would say, well, multi, you know, everything is bounced. So how much of its brains and how much of it's a bull market. But I think it's closer to the right strategy than not. And it's, it's the only strategy I'll implement from here on out. And the thing is, is it doesn't matter what you call yourself if you're a value investor, growth investor, or anything else. If you are a long-term investor, right, where you're, you're buying companies and you're, you're, the mechanism by which you are expecting to make money is through the corporate performance of the companies you invest in, not because you're trying to arbitrage stock price moves, right, but because you're trying to participate in the value generation of the corporations in which you are a shareholder, right? If that is your strategy, it doesn't matter what you call yourself or, or kind of what style you use, um, you, you recognize that you then have to pay a price that is less than what those future cash flows are going to be. And if you look at something like, say, the price to book uh, multiple that you know, was, a, was a popular form of value investing for a long time and has failed for a long time, that was just a proxy for understanding current price versus future cash flows. Yeah. Once upon a time, uh, in a tangible asset world, book value was a rather good way to create a stable estimate of future returns. So if you look at like the ROE on a company that's a tangible book value sort of company, well, you build that book. That's how you keep growing earnings, right? And so that, that made a lot of sense, you know, um, but it never meant the book value is relevant. Book value is only relevant when you're going bankrupt. I don't ever want to have a claim on book value on a company, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, this, this is, I don't, it's, yes, yeah, in theory, we own some pro rata portion of it, but I sure hope I don't get it ever, right? Yeah, things what have gone wanted, horribly wrong. Yeah, exactly, right? And so um, we're trying to invest in businesses that don't have a chance of going bankrupt. So I don't really feel like I need a margin of safety on their balance sheet to cover me if they do go bankrupt. I've made a huge mistake and we're going to be out of a stock, hopefully well before we're getting any claim on book value. Um, and, and so, but that doesn't mean that book value is irrelevant, right? So in, in, in banks and in insurers, it's still a very relevant metric. Give me a break. Of course it is. Cause, cause these are these are tangible asset businesses, right? And, um, and so, you know, I think that the key thing is just understanding that when people say value investing has not worked for a long time, what they're really saying is the proxies that we used to use for evaluating these things no longer are good proxies, yeah. right? Yep. And, and, or they're just due for a monster comeback. But I think the world's changed a lot. And those proxies, the ones that have failed, are going to keep failing because they're yeah. not good proxies of, of businesses today. But that doesn't mean they're, they're bad in every, every instance. You know? and, and so the challenging thing is it's hard for investors to, to accept that what they're owning is something in the future and that that future is unpredictable. And so because we hate uncertainty, we, we create a proxy for the future and we substitute with something current that we can look at and see. And we say, oh, there you go. There's my value. Look, it's you know, 15 times earnings. That's cheap. But those earnings, those are yesterday's earnings. You don't get a piece of those. You get tomorrow's cash flow, right? Yep. And so I think that's the key thing is recognizing their proxies. Proxies are super useful, um, but they are not. What, don't, don't substitute them for your real goal, right? Yeah. When, when you own something like Heiko or Transdime, and I, I'm not uh, trying to ask about them specifically, I'm more thinking about the, the idea of serial acquirers. How do you think through underwriting the acquisitions, right? And how much of the value is accretive and when it's going to occur, you know, just high level. How do you think through that stuff? So when we first invested in Transdime, um, if you, at the time, if you had looked at it and assumed no acquisitions, it looked like it was an expensive stock. But Transdime is, is pretty much like a private equity company, right? And so imagine buying a private equity company, but assuming there was no more deals they were ever going to do. Yeah. <laughs> that, like, that's actually not, what they do, right? I mean, like, it doesn't yeah, make any that's sense. That's not exactly right? reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so with Transdime, we made a forecast of how much they were going to spend on M&A and the returns they were going to generate on that M&A and how it would play out over time. And so... Just like anyone investing in a company that doesn't do M&A, you're going to forecast what your CapEx is or your growth spend or whatever it is. This was just the mechanism which Terenzyme was doing that, right? And it was clearly an ongoing strategic part of what they 
did. That was their business, is their business, right? And, and so we modeled in future M&A. At the time, it was the only company that we had ever done that with. But hmm. we had never really thought about it. like a roll up is that's a nasty word in in our shop back then, you know. And it's like you know, the roll ups. This is I don't want to look at a roll up, right? And, yeah. And and so, but then understanding what well, no, you know, this is a this is their business model, right? And and uh, you know, no one calls Berkshire Hathaway a roll up. Yeah. Right? Right. You know. And and so, um, you know, today we we are generally quite um cautious to model M and A. Um, if you think about like the base rate on M&A for all companies, it's not good, right? Yeah. And so um, if we don't model M&A, like we have companies that we know are going to do some M&A. By not modeling it, all we're really doing is assuming that they're going to earn their cost of capital on that M&A. Because if you earn your cost of capital on the M&A that you do, um, it is uh, no different than, say, paying it out to shareholders or buying back your share price at fair value or whatever it might be. So for us, it's like, this is just a real cash flow. Yeah. So when we explicitly are modeling M&A, what we're doing is, oh, they have this ability to reinvest cash into M&A at higher rates of return, right? Than just like kicking it back to us as a dividend so we can go reinvest it in our strategy mm -hmm. or something, right? And so that's pretty rare when you can find a company that can systematically over and over again at a level and size that makes it a material different can keep doing that and it's part of their ongoing business business model. Um, but when that's the case, well, you'd be silly to ignore it, right? And so so that's how we we go about doing that. It's important though, if you're modeling this for you know people that are analysts and as technical as recognizing that, um, that's gonna get reinvested at the returns that they earn on their M&A, not the kind of returns on invested capital that maybe their core business is doing. And it's typically gonna be lower, right? Yeah. And and so understanding those differences is important. But um, you know, we own Broadridge Financial and on their investor day today, they pointed out that they've grown, they've had 2% to revenue growth um, for the last six years running and they and they calculated 19% IRR on those, that M&A investment. And, and we think that's generally about correct. And yeah, that's a value creative, you know, behavior for them. And they're very likely to keep doing that. When do you think through, because you and I have talked about a name offline that you, like you had said, well, they only grow through M&A through M &A and not organic uh, growth. Uh, but how, do, how do you decide, like, this is not a name that I'm comfortable with the acquisition side driving the growth because the organic growth isn't there? Or, or is, if there's no organic growth, is it just a non-starter for you? Well, let's throw Transdime out. I think Transdime is a special special case and this complex sort of situation and everything. But in general, we want the core business to have its own kind of ongoing sustainable organic growth rate, and that M and A should be on top of that, really. You know. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so we've written about kind of low growth risk that most investors think about high growth companies as being risky companies, right? And a company that grows, you know, three percent every year feels like it might not be, you know. The grand slam, but this is a safe stock, right? And, and it's not not risky. But as we've shown in some of our, our publications, right? So if you if your terminal growth, if your long term growth rate is three percent, not four percent, there is a huge impact to valuation, right? Two percent versus four percent. Oh my gosh, look out yeah. below, right? And so when you're making a forecast for a stock and you say to yourself, well, it can grow four percent per year for the you know decade or more, what if you're wrong and it's only three percent? That's a very yeah. thin margin of error. So margin of safety becomes a real issue because you, you have to be forecasting down to one percentage point differentials in, in growth rates make a difference, right? And so we just kind of as a rule um, are looking for businesses that we think can grow organically at or above nominal GDP, basically in perpetuity, right? And, and obviously it's perpetuity is a very long time, right? But I mean, you know, for the foreseeable future, right? Yeah. And um, because if they get below that, we think of it, we call it stall speed. It's this idea that like basically you're losing share of GDP. If you're growing yep. slower than GDP, you are losing market share, right? You're losing market share is the wrong word. Wallet share of total GDP, which what mm -hmm. that means is it means you're becoming less and less relevant to the economy. And we don't want to invest in businesses that are have declining relevance, right? We want companies that are investing that have persistent and maybe even increasing relevance. Um, and so, you know, stall speed is this idea that when a plane hits stall speed, you crash, right? And so yeah. when you run the risk, once you start coasting at a growth rate slower than the economy, you start, you're, you're right at that stall speed. And, and, and maybe you, you aren't, if, if you could tell me like treasury bonds don't grow, but I could value that no problem. Cause it's yeah. guaranteed at a certain rate. That's fine. Right. But most companies, you can't guarantee a low growth rate forever. 
Well, I think that where a couple of these concepts can come together is if you're at your stall speed and you have a management that is incented to grow earnings or something like that, there is a real possibility that they try to do so by mortgaging their moat. And then you start to get into this sort of like negative cycle where, you know, you'd look at a consumer product company that you guys wrote about. When was that? Was that 2018 or 2017 when you first highlighted that you thought that there was risk in that? Uh, I think it must have been those prestige brands. And I think that must have been 20, 2018, right? Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yeah. Now, you know, they had their, your thesis was somewhat different, right? It was a uh, distribution barriers or are, are eroding, right? And there's going to be increased competition. But I, th- I think everything is a confluence, like Charlie Munger's Lollapalooza effect, right? Where it's like everything starts to work against you all of a sudden, sudden if you're hitting stall speed, as opposed to if you've got that momentum, you can do things like Netflix is doing where you're underpricing your product and you're delivering joy to your computer to your consumer yeah. and then you know it's just like a virtuous cycle right so uh aligning yourselves on treadmills that are going the right way are probably a pretty smart strategy in life i think for us um i hope it's smart most importantly it fits our personality as investors and so it works for us right yeah. but most people don't want to be investing in super low growth or declining businesses right and that suggests to me that there is a great opportunity for other investors who are wired differently and think differently to go make money in those stocks. It's just, yeah. we're not going to make money in those stocks. Right. And so we have to play in the area where we think we are competitively advantaged. Right. And so, you know, we're not in theory, every company has a value, but you know, every company could be a good investment, but not for us. We are a very yeah. limited set of companies. That I think we have any capabilities to, to analyze, understand, and then own for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years and not get shaken out at the wrong time. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that the tough thing when you're on one of those that's at stall speed, to your point, is if if you then like really stall, how are you the guy that's not shaken out at the, or or girl at, that's not shaken out at the wrong time, right? Because it's very it gets very hard to decipher. Uh, thesis creep can be a very real thing. It's real everywhere, right? But yeah. um, when you're in that situation, it can get very difficult. I read something that you wrote about uh, position sizing, and I really liked how you framed this. And you said, if somebody offered you two to one odds that the sun would come up tomorrow, you should make that a much larger bet than if someone offers you a thousand to one that it will rain tomorrow. And from a portfolio standpoint, that's that has, uh, that's a very, very smart uh, thought, sir. I, I give you uh, mad props for saying that. It may not you know, quite be as prophetic as I thought it was, but it changed the way that I really thought about stuff. You know, when I said that coming out of the financial crisis, you know, just kind of revaluing what we did, what lessons we learned, I spent a long time really focused on, on position sizing and trying to think about it. And what I found frustrating, but then also curious and interesting and why I became so passionate about it is there is very little written about position sizing. So yeah. all day, every day, CNBC, people come along and tell you what to buy, where it's going. <laughs> Nobody tells you how much. Yeah, by the right? way, it's 30 basis points in my portfolio. <laughs> yeah, and they, they will never recommend it, right? And, and yeah. you look for books, there's a ton of books out there, how to pick stocks, there's how to short stocks. They never tell you how much to buy, right? Yeah. And so the Kelly Criterion is, you know, everyone holds this up and, and the Kelly Criterion is a, is a fantastic um, mathematical, um, kind of philosophy around position sizing. And for listeners that don't know, the kind of Kelly criterion basically was about blackjack betting and basically was this way to understand that um, what you cared about was not only what the payoff is going to be, right? Which is what everyone focuses on at Wall Street, how much the stock's going to go up, but also how likely you were to be right. And the Kelly criterion demonstrates mathematically that it is the likelihood of being correct that is far bigger driver of how big your bet should be or your position size should be than what the upside is. And so the analogy that kind of, you know, because I know the sun's going to come up tomorrow, I would bet my life savings for a two to one payoff that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Yeah. But because it may or may not rain tomorrow, no matter what the forecasts say, I have to make a much smaller bet, even if the payoff's really large, because I, I can't risk ruin, right? Yeah. I can't get wiped out on a bet that might not play off, right? And so what that's, that speaks to is that position sizing should be driven far more by the likelihood that you will be correct than by how much you'll make, right? Yeah. If you are correct. They're both important, but but that's the, that's, the key, that's the key piece. The problem with the Kelly criterion is that to use that formula, you actually have to know what those odds are. Yep. And as investors, we do not know 
the likelihood that we will be right. We do not know what the payoff will be if we if we are right, right? And what will happen if we aren't right? None of that is knowable. And so therefore you can't just, you know, plug in these estimates into you know the, the formula and, and get your answers, right? Um, but philosophically that's informed what, what we did. And and you know, going into um kind of this evaluation, we had always run about 20 to 25 securities in our portfolio. And um and then kind of Lo and behold, as I did more and more research, I kind of realized, well, there was a whole lot of academic and practitioner evidence that that's actually the sweet spot, right? That if you add, build a portfolio of randomly selected stocks and you have five stocks in your portfolio and you go to 10, you will greatly reduce the volatility um, of your portfolio really significantly and greatly reduce the risk of ruin, right? Yeah. But as you get out towards 20 to 25 and get towards 30, the incremental benefit is super tiny, right? And so that that research that was first done for the book Random Walk Down Wall Street was written by somebody who believed in efficient market hypothesis, like full full bore. And so um, Bert Malkiel was like, so therefore you just keep adding diversification because I mean it's it's a free lunch, right? But I don't have a hundred good ideas. Yeah. I don't think anybody does. The average mutual fund owns 150 securities. I mean, how could you care enough about those companies to, to do the work that we do to really understand something if you don't even have 100 basis points in your portfolio, right? Yeah. I mean, we live and breathe the companies that we own because we own them in size, right? But I'm, I'm given comfort by the fact that I know that by owning the number that we own, there's no reason we should be any more volatile than the market overall. And our track record suggests exactly that, right? So it's not just the, the theory, but it's actually in practice, you know? And um, the one key thing is remember that was from randomly selected securities and we don't select them randomly. So you have to be very careful if you are an active manager running a focused portfolio that you don't have too many securities that are overly correlated to each other. And we don't think about that correlation as a, as a stock market correlation. We think about it as demand correlation, right? So we, we did analysis where you have a number of stocks that are kind of in the housing industry in one way or another. And we've done some analysis and said like, they just don't actually trade as closely together as you would, you would think. And the mm -hmm. reason is they're all in different demand cycles, right? Yeah. Like new housing doesn't go the same patterns as home improvement, which doesn't go in the same way as installing services, right? And so you can participate in a concentration in an industry so long as the drivers are, are different, right? And so we hope, and I think our, our track record suggests that we have plenty of diversification in kind of end market demand within our portfolio. Um, despite the fact that sometimes our sector allocations can seem like super overweight or super underweight. Um, like we've owned a lot of industrials and you think, oh, but they must be long, a ton of factories and stuff, but a lot of them are business service stocks serving totally different businesses, right? And so they're, they're not correlated and it's not really a concentrated bet on industrials. Yeah, I, um, I, I was, it's funny. I mean, I don't know. I came in a traditional value way and, you know, cheap stuff, cheap stuff, cheap, cheap stuff. And then I realized after a little while, I, I call myself, I've been a professional for maybe four years. Right. And, and the other years were just me trying to figure out all the stupid stuff not to do anymore. And I realized a lot of the stuff that I owned had completely, you know, it may have looked like 12 separate bets, but at the end of the day, the correlation was super high on that. And I, and I finally asked myself, I said, well, what am I so afraid of paying up for some of these better businesses? And then it was sort of, um, you know, it became, well, I'll add one to the portfolio, right? And then I'll add two to the portfolio. And then I realized, oh, my portfolio is performing much better because there's actually diversification in the portfolio, right? I'm getting the portfolio benefits of being in different uh, it sounds so stupid to say out loud because it's clearly what the research shows, but behaviorally, I had been so ingrained to avoid paying up that I think that I was taking way more risk than I appreciated at the time, uh, which is, you know, part of why I started down this journey was to, I, I had um, inherited some money and I didn't control all of it. And I said, well, I, I have to figure out how to run a small amount before I can be responsible for, a, you know, more Right. And I'm glad that I didn't inherit it earlier because I probably would have blown it on a bunch of correlated bets going into 2008. So mm -hmm. yeah, sure. I'd have been in sure. a lot of the things that blew up because they were cheap. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, before we go on, let's dig a little bit more into conviction and position sizing, because yeah. conviction is a phrase people throw around a lot. Like I've got a lot of conviction in this this stock, which may just mean it's gone up a whole lot and I love it. Right. And, and when it goes back down, I don't have conviction in this stock anymore. Right. So so when I say conviction, I don't just mean that we love a company. What I mean is that we 
rate all of our holdings across seven different elements on conviction, our confidence that we are right about that element of the business. And so that is the strength of their moat. How confident are we that whatever we think the moat is can protect them from competition? And then the ongoing long-term, like decade plus relevance of their product. How confident are we that this company's products or services will be as or more relevant in the future than they are today? And then we look at management and we wanna understand how confident are we that they are gonna be able to create value for their customers, right? Create value for all of their stakeholders and create value for us as, as shareholders. We think you know that, that you can look at management teams just through each of those lens. And some of them will score well on some aspects, right? Like, I mean, Transdimes, like shareholder max, right? You yeah. can have some big arguments on how do they think about stakeholders overall, and maybe it's a lot lower, right? And, and so you have to look at these differently. You have con conviction in different elements of it. And then we think about kind of how intrinsically forecastable a business is, right? So like a consumer products, CFO can tell you what the next five year price increases were going to be and be accurate within a couple percentage points. But an honest oil C CFO is, you know, uh, you know, ENP CFO is not going to tell you what the price of oil is in the next five years, right? Yeah. Be off by a lot, right? So is some businesses are intrinsically more forecastable, right? And then there's just our own circle of competence, right? How, how well can, are we positioned to understand this? And so we, we have a threshold level for every company in our portfolio to reach a certain threshold on all of those. And then within our portfolio, we force rank everything on those, which is a really tough thing is where you're picking between your kids, right? Like yeah. we love all of our holdings. Otherwise we would not own them, right? If we didn't love a holding, it's out of the portfolio, right? And, and so we love all of them, but we force rank all of them on each of those questions, right? And then we're able to, to develop a quantitative score of conviction. And so when the stock starts going down and we get worried, right? We don't just say like, well, I've lost conviction. I think we should lower the position size. We, we, if we get worried, we go look at our ratings and we understand like wh where, where is the worry? It's probably not on all seven issues. It's probably in certain issues, right? And then we, we zero in on that and say like, are we actually have less conviction on that versus our other companies? Or is it just like, this is what, what exactly is going on? So as an example, owning booking holdings during a global pandemic was, is scary. Right. Yeah. And they had negative revenue in April of this year. Right. Yeah. Our conviction in, in our in the forecastability, it declined significantly. And it's still lower than what it was pre pandemic because we do not have as much confidence in what global travel patterns are going to be like over the next five years. If anybody thinks that they are as confident on what global travel patterns are going to be in the next five years versus what they were pre pandemic, they're crazy. Right. Yeah. So our conviction, that element of booking lower not because we got scared but because hey realistically we don't know right yep. and there's there's that. but we also were like but but humans our dna impels us to travel that is why humans have covered the entire globe right and yeah. so we are certain that it's going to come come back at some point right and so we kind of you know look at these different elements by the end of the day even printing negative revenue we were like hey the core things are all here Right. And, and, and we had to make sure, can they get to the other side? That was our big analysis starting in March was every business has to survive to be a long term winner. Right. Yeah. And and booking, which, you know, we did our own analysis and they validate when they came out in April and said, basically, hey, look, everybody, we've raised some more cash. The market's only making us pay four percent for this new debt. They're making Airbnb at the time pay 11 percent, Expedia 11 percent. But they're, they're giving it to us for four percent. Right. Kind of amazing. We have negative revenue and the market's lending us money at 4%. That's how confident the market is, debt market is in us. And, and guess what? We could have no revenue through the end of 2021 and we're, we, we, we'll, we can still operate. Right. Um, that is an incredibly resilient business. Right. So for booking 60% of their cost structure pre pandemic was through marketing, but you don't need to do any marketing when there's no demand. Yeah. So, so those costs just shut off along with the revenue opportunity. Right. And so um, they had the ability to greatly reduce their cost structure in the face of very, very, very weak demand, you know. Um, but we were able to have our, our conviction, even though we were scared, like any sensible person was in, in April, um, because there was nothing in our conviction ratings where we'd say, yep, that's actually all that, you know, a disqualifying level of, of you know, a low, low, um, a low rating, right? That is too low for us, right? And so really, I think that for us, that's become kind of a, the lodestar, right, is that we understand quantitatively what our convictions are in, in business. And we might be wrong, but that then allows us to, to quantitatively create position sizes. So there is no discussion. I'm the CIO, but there's no discussion. I don't ever say, let's hold Netflix through earnings and see how it does. And or maybe we should lighten up. Those discussions don't happen in Ensemble. Do you what have a devil's is, advocate? Sorry. Do you have a, a, uh, let me like talk a, about devil's advocate in a second. But so we don't, we don't, when we talk about trading, it is that 
the formula that we use for position sizing, that's a function of conviction plus upside appreciation, kind of Kelly inspired, is calling for a certain position size and we are going to drive our portfolios towards that position size. And to the extent that it feels wrong to us as you know, hopefully informed discretionary managers, right? We don't just say, well, let's just feel differently about it. We say, what's wrong with our model, right? And we yeah. dig into that and understand what are we feeling? And sometimes we recognize, you know what? We haven't captured something in our formulaic model. It's just a model, right? And so it's not it's not reality, right? And so then we might adjust our model, which we do from time to time, you know? Or we recognize that we gotta change these scores because we didn't appreciate something. And other times we just realize, nope, it's telling us to trim and we just don't feel like it, right? <laughs> and, and, and But we're gonna go with what we know is the right, the right path to do. So it's, yeah. we actually have a very quantitatively implemented position sizing framework, which is the, the total opposite of the very, very, very qualitative work we do on, on competitive advantage analysis. But I think that's right, because I think humans are way better than computers at understanding competitive advantages. But computers are way better than humans at understanding the statistical position sizing that you should own based on that qualitative input. So so for us, it's about let's let the computer do what it's good at. We do what we're good at, you know, and um, and, and that's been the right match for us. Lives up to your name, sir. An ensemble <laughs> of things working together, Yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you asked about devil's advocate. What yeah, yeah. Just to that? make sure that you didn't fall in love with your quantitative ratings, right? If the three of you sort of like the business, I mean, do you do you put somebody in the room to shred it to part pieces or say, no way, it doesn't deserve that quantitative rating. You're too in love with it. So it is a good thing that me and RF and Todd enjoy each other's company so much because we argue all day, every day. Like that's that's <laughs> like basically what what we do. You know, I mean, it's 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 credible. Now, if any analyst on our team believes that a company in our portfolio doesn't meet a threshold level of conviction in any one of the areas. We will argue about it, but if if they don't yield, it's out of the portfolio, right? So this is not, a, it's not managed by consensus, right? We're not all deciding, oh, we all have to be in. It's that, but if there's any aspect where someone's like, guys, this doesn't even meet our threshold level, because we're only looking for 20, 25 stocks, right? So if some of the team is like pulling the ripcord, well, go find something else, right? Yeah. It's like return on brain damage sort of issue, right? Just go find something something different, right? Um, but we all have our own ratings, right? And and we we review them regularly. And when they are different from each other, we kind of dig into why that is and, and we debate it. And we sometimes will recognize, oh, one person wasn't thinking about that question the same way somebody else was. And, and then maybe both our views get enhanced and we might change or not change our ratings, but they've been improved, right? And other times we say, we're all looking at the same facts, we just have different opinions and that is fine, right? And so we kind of roll those up and um, act on that. Um, we don't have a formal devil's advocate kind of concept, right? So for, for listeners, like basically the idea that somebody on the team should be in charge of kind of figuring out the bear case and advocating for the bear case. I think the problem with that approach is that everybody knows that's the devil's advocate. And mm. so everyone's kind of like, well, I can kind of dismiss that because they're just doing their job, right? <laughs> yeah, they have to do this. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And so it, it, and it can and it can really create, I think, an environment of confrontation. And I know there's some businesses, some mm -hmm. investors that, that have thrived through environments of confrontation. We argue a lot, but it is not a emotional confrontation. There is no yelling at Ensemble, right? There, there is no name calling at Ensemble, right? I mean, we have passionate discussions about how we view the world. And we recognize that the other people on, on the team with us are there in that seat because their point of view is just as valid as the other person's, including mine. It doesn't matter that I'm a CIO. There's nothing about my point of view that is somehow more enlightened or, you know, I don't have any better view of reality than other people on my team. I just have my view of reality, right? And and so, you know, the idea of setting somebody up as being kind of the, the fall guy, right? That, that you say, well, they, I don't have to worry about the risks for me because they got that covered. And since they're the risk person, then I can ignore them, right? Hmm. So we're all responsible for those those risks. Um, but we absolutely, you know, challenge each other on on different things, and we absolutely have different opinions. And and um, you know, one of us is the lead analyst on every name, including myself. I know there's CIOs who don't aren't actually analysts, but to me, this would be a boring job if I didn't cover stocks. I mean, that's kind of why I got into the business, right? And so we each cover about a third of the the, the portfolio as the lead analyst. Um, but they're just the lead, right? And and so you know, the leads can often kind of fall in love with the company a little bit, and, and that's a good yeah. thing. We want to love our company, um, but it's the job of all of ours to to challenge each other. And so every quarter, every company, there's something that we don't like, right? I mean, if if you think a company printed a perfect quarter, you're not paying attention. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I like that approach. Uh, we're coming up on time, so my last question before I let you go: errors of omission. What's one that really really grinds your gears? You know, um, 
was asked this question recently, and it, I know that people say this, like, oh, it's this, you know, errors of omission are more important than errors of commission. But if you're investing in 20 to 25 stocks, you miss a ton of stuff. That's yeah. by design. It's not a mistake. It's like, I mean, you know, people ask us all the time, well, why don't you own this? And the answer more often than not is because we've never done a deep dive on it. That's why. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and I, I think that that the um, it's not exactly an error of omission, but I think it gets at what you're asking about is that and it really kind of influenced how I think about. Um, valuing stocks and paying attention to, to different companies is um, when Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars mm -hmm. and they had 17 employees and zero revenue. I thought to myself, I don't even have to research this deal. Clearly, mm -hmm. we're back in the, another bubble. This is a silly dot com era sorts of things. You don't pay a billion dollars for a company with no revenue. And clearly, I was terribly wrong. Right. I just didn't know what I was talking about. But I had I, I told myself I don't have to do the work because I already can tell that this is an idiotic move. But I mean, what a dumb thing to say. Face was a super successful company. Mark Zuckerberg is a brilliant individual. He went do something that was just obviously incorrect that you could tell without even doing real diligence on it. Right. And so when I recognized over time that like gosh, I had such a naive, dumb reaction to that. And why was that? When I realized it just came down to, I held an opinion despite not actually having done the work, right? And so, you know, we live in an environment right now where, you know, companies are going public and getting 100% pops on their IPO. And boy, is that a danger signal, right? But I refuse to, to look at any of those companies and say to myself, I know they're overvalued. I mean, you know, there's companies out there selling like 200 times sales right now. And I mean, I think they're overvalued, right? I would kind of, that'd be my guess, <laughs> yeah. but I just, I don't know. And so therefore, I, you know, I, I shouldn't have an opinion. We work way too hard to have the opinions that we have on our stocks in our portfolio for us to somehow seemingly be able to dismiss companies we haven't done any work on and say, I don't even need to do that. And so I think that the, the sin of omission for me was I'm um, kind of thinking to myself, I don't have to pay attention to Facebook or Instagram because gosh, this is just dumb stuff. And that was so clearly wrong. And I think that going forward uh, over time, it took me a while to figure this out. I was just realizing this is one of the reasons why we don't look at valuation when we start looking at stocks. It's just say, mm -hmm. you, just, you don't know, right? So for us, we start to look at a stock because usually we, we hear something about them that is kind of unusual, kind of idiosyncratic, something that doesn't make sense and something that relates to competitive advantages. And then we start digging a little bit, right? And we, we dig into that more and more. And, you know, we get asked by especially institutional investors, like, what's your process for idea generation? And, and I wish that I could tell them, well, we have this six-step process and just go process it through. It's like a little factory here and stuff like that. But if that was the case, anyone else could do it too, right? Yeah. And so what we're doing is a much more organic process. And, and there is absolutely a repayable system to what we do. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep, up, keep coming up with new ideas, right? But it is a very organic process. And, and what it is, is that we're looking for something that not, I mean, other people look for completely managed businesses, of course, right? But that is that is our lodestar, right? And so what we're looking for is signals about that. So, you know, when it came back to First Republic, it, it, I didn't look at the stock price. I didn't look at their ROE. I just heard that this wasn't a bank. It was a customer service business. And that just was intriguing to me. And then I very quickly realized they have customer service stats that make them look like the most loved companies in the world. And the banking industry has terrible stats. What is going on here? I hadn't looked at valuation yet. I hadn't looked at their growth rate. It's like, uh, this is what gets me digging. This is what gets me excited, you know? And so, but I just have learned, don't have opinions on any stocks until you've actually done done the work, right? And, and so I really should have, in retrospect, said, why'd they pay a billion dollars for a company with no revenue? There must be something really interesting there, right? Yeah. And, and instead, I closed my mind to it, right? And I said, I, I don't even need to pay attention because it's obviously dumb. And I was the one who was dumb. It's so one of the best answers I've heard to that. And I'm not just blowing smoke. I did the <laughs> same exact thing. And I it triggered two thoughts for me. One, I quote him a lot because what he says makes sense to me. Adam Robinson once said to Tim Ferriss, he said, look in places that are like glaringly obvious and places that don't make any sense. So mm -hmm. if you see a headline and it's like perfectly obvious or just doesn't make any sense, dig, right? Don't form an opinion. And then the other ones like this old Tony Robbins, ask better questions, get better answers. Um, but Sean, I really appreciated your time, man. I hope that, uh, that everybody listening has too. And I look forward to uh, many conversations in the future. Bill, thanks so much for having me. I, you know, it's fun to have this sort of conversation as opposed to, you know, 20 minutes of kind of some stock questions and, and playing this all out and covering the ground we did. So um, best of luck on your podcast. I've really been enjoying them and, and look forward to hearing from a lot more people. Thank you. Take care, man. All right, Bill.